Robert, thank you so much for joining us in this warm up series and in the festival Love at First Sight. It's a pleasure and an honor welcoming you here. A deep thank you to my translators, uh, Yvonne, Sevi, and Maria. You know, you're the ones who will bring my words out to everyone. So before we start, I would like to begin with a prayer. Um, at the Foundation for Inner Peace, where I work, we use this prayer before pretty much every meeting. Um, sometimes we use a different one, but um, it's a good one. Bill Thetford, one of the co-scribes, requested help before a conference because he was very nervous about what to say. And this is what um, Jesus brought to him through Helen Shuckman. I change it from I to we, from first person singular to plural. <clears throat> we are here only to be truly helpful. We are here to represent him who sent us. We do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent us will direct us. We are content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with us. We will be healed as we let him teach us to heal. Okay. Now everything that happens is guided, so we're all good. <clears throat> so the topic that um, Andreas, who graciously invited me to be part of this, um, that, that I was given was love at first sight. And I don't know whether that's uh, the same for all of the presenters here. Yeah, sounds like it. But when I heard this, I was delighted. <laughs> I am a big fan of words and playing with words. And so this love at first sight just, just spoke to me right away because it works on so many different levels, just as A Course in Miracles does. At the most superficial level, the surface level, love at first sight is a very common expression Love at first sight is, you know, oh my gosh, eyes meet across a crowded room and you fall in love and you know that he, she, or they is the one for you for the rest of your life. Um, and it is, quote, love at first sight. This obviously is the ego's um, special relationship that the Course talks about so much. Love at first sight, if we think about it, um, tells us that we don't really know who the person is that we're seeing. You know, it's first sight. We know nothing about them, and yet we're falling in love. We're falling in love. This is the ego's specialness. That other being has something to offer us, usually their body, they're attractive, they're articulate, um, they're famous, they sing well, you name it. But they have something to offer us that we believe we lack. And the moment we feel that we lack something, well, we're in the ego's world. Spirit cannot lack anything. It's impossible because spirit is everything. God is everything. And therefore, um, you can't even say God has everything because being and having are the same thing. And I think it's chapter six of the text that goes into this in some detail. So the ego, ego's version of special love is love at first sight. You know, there's a special someone out there just for you. And when you find them, ah, Life will be forever sweet thereafter. 
And anyone who's followed this path or been in a relationship for any length of time has learned that the honeymoon phase, the bliss, the initial charge of being in love never lasts. It can't because it's built on fantasy. So the expression love at first sight um, starts with the ego's fantasy of what it understands will bring salvation. Salvation lies in special relationships. Well, if we're all good course students, or even if we're bad course students, even if we're new course students, we've learned by now that that's not really what we want. Um, and the course, of course, offers us an alternative the holy relationship. But I won't be speaking about that today. Um, I'll be talking about that next week um, while talking about forgiveness. So be sure to stay tuned for that because uh, that should be a fun one. Now, how do we take love at first sight um, as, as a course student might? Well, to me, there, there's several key important terms here. Love is obviously the first of those. Um, love is the foundation on which everything else is built because God is love. God's son, all of us are love. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're really, there is nothing else apart from love. But love at first sight, huh? not sure how, what, what do we do with that? What is first sight and what is sight? And again, we come back to the distinction to the ego. Sight is what we do with these eyes. And some of us have to wear glasses to see clearly. And the world we're seeing with our sight, with our body's eyes is a world of perception. And the world of perception the Course teaches, is the world of separation. What does that mean? Well, think about it. Everything you see, everything you hear, everything you touch, every smell, every taste, they are all discrete and separate from everything else. So right now I'm looking at a number of faces, you all seem separate from me. Although it's so cool that we can do this virtually and come from all around the world and, and be together in this virtual space of love. Um, but perception reinforces the ego's world. So first sight might be falling in love, but it might also be what we see with the eyes of the ego. But that's not what the Holy Spirit and Jesus are teaching us. They're teaching us a different kind of sight. <clears throat> so what might that be? Well, in heaven, where all is one and where all of us are one and have always been one, in heaven, where the separation never occurred, um, there is no such thing as sight. You can't see, you can't hear, you don't need to. You're already everything because that's all there is. And that's more than enough. So we can't be talking about first sight at the level of oneness or heaven. I like to think of it as, as sort of a, a coming in and a going out. So um, the first section of chapter 18 of the text called the substitute reality in English talks about how we started with one idea. You know, the Son of God said, huh, I wonder what it would be like to be separate from God. And because the mind is so powerful at that level, the mind of the Son, the mind of the Father, it instantly came to be. Not in reality, we can't change God, but in our mind, we, we entered a delusion. We went nuts, we went crazy, and we started to live in a hallucination. So we could say, well, that's first sight. The first time we ever saw and had to use eyes 
was when we woke up and said, oh my gosh, I'm a body. <laughs> How did that happen? Um, and I think this is what is portrayed in the Bible when Adam and Eve eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and suddenly look down and go, whoa, we have no clothes. Let's hide ourselves. This is where hiding began. And the course is all about not hiding, looking at those things that we've hidden out of shame, out of anger, out of fear, and bringing them to truth, bringing them to light. And so if first sight was what we experienced on the way into the delusion, <clears throat> the course tells us that the Holy Spirit has an answer, a correction for every single thing within the illusion. And that would be the Holy Spirit's reinterpretation of sight, which is Christ's vision. So when we use Christ's vision, and, and this is a concept that's not that easy, um, a couple of quotes um, that, that will help us to understand it. Um, and I just got a message that my internet connection is unstable. I hope that you're all still hearing me and seeing me. Um, I don't think there's anything I can do about it, except give it to the Holy Spirit for correction and healing. We can hear and see you now. Okay, so, all right, good. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to read, um, I want to read paragraph seven from workbook lesson 158. Um, I, this is one of my thousand favorite course quotes, because um, there are so many, um, but it, I think it really, um, it really nails it. It, 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 it gets the essence of Christ's vision very accurately. <clears throat> so here's the quote. Christ's vision has one law. It does not look upon a body and mistake it for the son whom God created. It beholds a light beyond the body, an idea beyond what can be touched, a purity undimmed by errors, pitiful mistakes and fearless thoughts of guilt from dreams of sin. It sees no separation and it looks on everyone, on every circumstance, all happenings and all events without the slightest fading of the light it sees. So there are a couple of key points here. This vision looks on light. It doesn't look on separation. It doesn't see bodies. The beautiful thing about light is it's the same no matter where you see it or in whom you see it. So when we look upon a brother or a sister with uh, Christ's vision and we look past the body, because the body's eyes are still here, we'll still behold bodies. But when we recognize that's not the reality, that's not who our brother truly is. That's not how God or the Holy Spirit sees our brother. When we understand that, and see only light, we are seeing everyone in the same light because everyone is the same. We are all aspects of the oneness that is the Son of God, that is the Christ. So first sight might be the first opening of the spiritual eye, um, and um, in some of the earlier drafts of A Course in Miracles, the early chapters of the text actually used the term spiritual eye, um, which I think later became Christ's vision. <clears throat> so first sight might be when we begin to glimpse our brothers and the world of perception with the eyes of spirit. And what the Course tells us, this is from Workbook Lesson 270, um, which is titled, I Will Not Use the Body's Eyes Today. Good luck with that, unless you put blinders over your eyes. But it's what we aspire to. So in this lesson, 
the prayer tells us, Father, Christ's vision is your gift to me. And it has power to translate all that the body's eyes behold into the sight of a forgiven world. Um, in chapter 12 of the text, section seven, um, paragraph 11, um, we're told, quote, through the eyes of Christ, only the real world exists and only the real world can be seen. As you decide, so will you see, and all that you see, but witnesses to your decision. In other words, we have to want to use Christ's vision. Um, we have to realize that the world, our eyes and our five senses bring to us, we have to realize that that world is illusion and that we want something different. Remember, um, or if you haven't heard it before, I'll share it. The whole um, inspiration for A Course in Miracles, what put it the, the scribing in motion for Helen Shuckman and Bill Thetford was Bill saying to Helen, there must be a better way. And I think each of us has to embrace that. If we believe that the world and the ego can offer us happiness, our happiness will be very brief at best. Um, and it will never last because after all, if we identify with the physical body, that body will die. Um, you know, think of it this way, everybody you know and love will die. You will die, we're all gonna die. Um, that's not a good um, recipe for love and, and eternal happiness. Christ's vision and what the Course calls the real world is. Now we could probably spend a whole weekend workshop on the idea of the real world. It's a very confusing concept for many people because the Course is very clear, the world is not real. You know, in, uh, in lesson 158, where the other quote I read comes from, it says, there is no world exclamation point. You know, this is the key lesson that this course tries to teach. Well, if there is no world, what is the real world? I think it's the course's, Jesus's best translation for the idea of looking at what we made without the ego's influence. What we made without our projection of our guilt uh, and our fear put out upon it. So if we're using Christ's vision, if we're looking through the eyes of Christ, all we're seeing is the real world. And the real world is, is, is quite lovely. Um, let me read uh, another quote because I think it takes it beyond perception. Um, and we want to go home. We want to return to heaven. We want to remember oneness. This is, this is a longing deep within each of us and every one of us. Um, we don't always recognize it, but it is what we want. However, we're still living here. And when we embrace the Course's teaching, when we learn to use Christ's vision, a strange thing happens. We find that we don't have to plan for the future. You know, workbook lesson 194 states, I place the future in the hands of God. We do that. Um, and miracles show up. That is to say, things just work better. So from uh, chapter 20 of the text, section eight, um, paragraphs five through six, uh, five, seven through six, one, quote, there is no problem, no event or situation, no perplexity that vision will not solve. I'm gonna pause here in the quote because what I wanna emphasize is that if we're seeing correctly with the Holy Spirit and Jesus as our partners, 
um, there can't be any problems. Um, you know, workbook lesson 79 tells us, let me recognize the problem so it can be solved. And then it goes on to tell us there's only one problem and that's the separation that's behind every single problem we think we see. Well, if we're using Christ's vision, we don't see separation, there are no problems. And with that vision, miracles, we open the door to miracles. Okay, so I'm returning to the quote, no problem, event, situation, no perplexity that vision will not solve. All is redeemed when looked upon with vision, for this is not your sight and brings with it the laws beloved of him whose sight it is. And that's when we use Christ's vision, we're under the laws of God, not the laws of ego or humans. And you'll remember workbook lesson 76 tells us, I am under no laws, but God's. We might believe we're enslaved to the ego, bound to laws that, that hurt us, but, but we're not in reality. And that's why the whole purpose of the course and the atonement is to wake us up. Continuing in, in paragraph six there, everything looked upon with vision falls gently into place according to the laws brought to it by his calm, the Holy Spirit's and certain sight. So if you were wondering, well, you know, my eyes work perfectly well. Why do I need Christ's vision? Well, you don't need it unless you would like to be happy. <laughs> um, because if you want happiness, there's really only one path to get there. Um, so love at first sight. Yeah, when we're using Christ's vision, we're looking upon everything through the eyes of spirit. And as a result, all we can do is love. You know, there's the very um, well-known uh, injunction in the course that tells us, you know, there's only love and uh, basically the obstacles to love, fear, guilt, shame, and that we can only make two responses to any brother. Um, if they come to us with love, we naturally respond with love. If they come to us with anything but love, we should respond with help and healing, which is also love. So our, our job is to, as the Course says in uh, chapter six of the text, teach only love, teach only love for that is what you are. And I'll say it again, teach only love for that is what you are. Um, over and over again, the, Jesus tells us in the course that, that it's impossible to serve two masters and that it's impossible to see two worlds. It's not possible. Um, let me read uh, one more quote and then we'll gradually wind up here. Um, this is from uh, chapter 13 of the text, section seven, the very opening lines. The world you see must be denied for sight of it is costing you a different kind of vision. And then in italics, emphasis, you cannot see both worlds for each of them involves a different kind of seeing and depends on what you cherish. In other words, if we cherish the things of the ego in the world, that's what we're going to see. And we can't see with Christ's vision. If we want to, um, if we're convinced there must be a better way and we want to find it, then we work to, to use Christ's vision and we will not see the world in the same way, not with the body's eyes. You cannot see both worlds for each of them involves a different kind of scene and depends on what you cherish. 
The sight of one is possible because you have denied the other. Both are not true, yet either one will seem as real to you as the amount to which you hold it dear. And yet their power is not the same because their real attraction to you is unequal. Now, let me uh, dig into that a little bit. The sight of one is not possible because you have denied the other. You can't use the body's eyes. You can't see the world of separation and differences and contrasts. You can't see that world if you're using Christ's vision. Um, by the same token, um, you can't see, you can't use Christ's vision. You couldn't see a world of separation um, if you hadn't cherished it and wanted it. You can't see one and have, you can't have them both. Um, so, you know, workbook lessons uh, 128, 129, and 130 tell us, you know, the world I see holds nothing that I want. 129 tells us beyond this world, there is a world I want. And then 130 tells us it is impossible to see two worlds. So there's a world you want, there's a world you don't want, even though you're trapped in it, and you can't see both of them. Um, their power is not the same though, because one is real. One lives in us eternally, it's our truth, our, our eternal reality. And the other is, is, is a bad dream, a nightmare and we just haven't woken up yet. You know, one of the uh, better lines in the course, which, uh, which is borrowed from Mary Baker Eddy of Christian Science, reminds us that the Bible says, Adam fell into a deep sleep when God you know, took his rib to make Eve. And uh, that's obviously ridiculous because in my experience, women are generally far more tuned in to spirit and love than men are. But we're working on it, ladies. You know, give us a chance. Um, it says, a deep sleep fell upon Adam, but nowhere does it tell us that he woke up. <laughs> so here we are. We're in the deep sleep still. You know, we're all dreaming. We think that the world we see is real, but it's not. And when we use the first sight of the Holy Spirit, all we see is love. All we bring to it is love. We teach only love because that is what we are. And when we do that, we awaken to our true self. Um, in English, this is capitalized with a capital S. Of course, in German, auf Deutsch, all nouns are capitalized, so that doesn't really matter as much. But our true self, is the unity, the oneness that all of us are and that God knows us as. And with that, I would like to thank everyone and say we all walk together on this journey. When you do your own inner work, you are saving the world. You are a savior. You are doing exactly what Jesus did. And that's our goal, that's our mission. So for all of you on the path with me and us, God bless and, um, you know, and I would say see you in heaven, but we won't be seeing each other. We'll be feeling each other. We'll be knowing each other with knowledge, um, which if you're a course student is the province of God. Thank you all very much. Amen. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for giving us a very good overview of what the title might mean. Yeah. When it came in, I thought, okay, that doesn't really make sense in a course context, but I totally trust in the speakers that they will make sense of it. <laughs> so, I loved it. I just loved it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely guided. <laughs> I do hope so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure That's listening awesome. to you. And I hope the rest of the warm up, uh, if there is any left, I don't know, I might be. It's the last one. It's the final, final warm up. Oh, so right? I did the wrap up. Okay. Yeah, you're the wrap up. There's, uh, there's the, Emily. Uh, the anchor lap of the wrap Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we have uh, Robert and Emily coming in to do the last half an hour. Okay. And uh, thank you with all our heart. And um, we're extending what we're hearing in our mind. Thank you so much, Robert.
Well, let's look on everybody with love. And uh, I don't know if Robert and Emily are hearing me, but yes, uh, here. much love to both of you. Thank We're you. here. All right, with that, I am going to sign off. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bob. What an honor it is to follow you. And I am grateful to be here at this event with all of you. And I don't see Robert, but I know that he's, he's here. here. He's You're here. here. I'm here. Yeah. Here. Okay. Although now we have to, to choose what we say carefully because so much of what we were planning to cover saying, was just Dr. Said. Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just, the course says the same basic lesson over and over and over in English for what, 1,471 pages? So I think repetition is okay. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you're. And I'm sorry if I stepped on your mojo, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Love y'all. Love Good. you too. Bye bye. See you. Bye. All right. Bye, Dr. Bob. Over to you, Emily and Robert. Welcome. Thank you for taking time to be with us tonight. Thank you. Thank it's you an honor us. to be here. Yeah. Honor to be here. So Robert, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Um, well, uh, our thoughts sparked by the title were somewhat similar to Dr. Bob's. Uh, you know, love at first sight sounds a lot like what the course talks about as vision. And so um, <clears throat> we'll you know, as our preview, we'll be talking a lot about, about vision here and in our talk as well. The setup for the idea, I think, is that the course, <coughs> excuse me, the course says that, that it's all about perception. It's all about seeing, truly. We don't see things as they are now. Um, when we look at people, we look upon some, an element of them, their body, their behavior, their personality, that's not who they are. And that ultimately we have to see past that to something real. And it's seeing past that, that is what the course calls true perception. But what does that mean? From the course's standpoint, our physical eyes can't see who they really are. When you look at somebody as, as Bob was saying, you see a body. When you look at that body, you see it behave in certain ways. Most of it directed by their ego, I think the course would say. Um, and so you basically see a body animated by an ego if you see with your eyes. Yet the course says there is this whole identity that lies past that, that we can't see with our eyes. And that identity, I mean, the course has a great deal to say about that, right? It is the son of God, it is spirit. It has no body and indeed no form because a form means a limit and it has no limit. This identity is pure light. Um, I was even thinking about reading that quote from lesson 158 that Dr. Bob read, great quote about Christ's vision. Um, the course says that they have inestimable worth worth that's so great it can't be estimated. It says that they possess holiness. And holiness is a powerful word that I think we tend to avoid in Course in Miracles circles, at least uh, in, English, in the English-speaking world. Holiness is a big concept. To think that each person is holy is a phenomenal idea. Um, and the Course says that this identity that is their real nature is our equal, that they are not lesser than us as we so often see people. So they have these attributes. They are light, they're formless, they're spirit, they have limitless worth, they possess holiness, they are, are equal. And none of that do we see with our eyes. And so it's very easy to look on people and devalue them and think that they don't have much worth, that they're extremely unholy because of what they've done, that they are not our equals, that they're more darkness than light. It's so easy. And yet the Course is saying, our goal is to see them truly. Well, how do we do that when our eyes can't see 
who they are, can't see the attributes that the course is saying they have. And this gets into the whole topic that, that Bob was talking about, the topic of vision. And the idea in the course is that there actually is another kind of sight within us. Um, he mentioned the spiritual eye. That's the language early in the text. After that, the language switches to the eyes of Christ. But I think you can see that the spiritual eye and the eyes of Christ, those are very similar terms. They, they suggest that there is a faculty of seeing that is within us that's not our normal physical sight. And the course talks about the, the spiritual eye or the eyes of Christ being asleep in us and needing to be opened. And this sounds like something that many traditions talk about, that there are faculties within us that are spiritual in essence and are currently closed, currently asleep. And so the course you could say is all about opening the eyes of Christ in us. And those eyes, just like our physical eyes, look on physical bodies plainly. You know, obviously you open your eyes, you see bodies, you have no doubt of what you're seeing, you see the shape, you see the color, you see the movement, you see all that. It's obvious. Well, if we had the eyes of Christ open within us, we would look out through those eyes and we wouldn't see shape and form and color and movement. We would see, it's a different kind of seeing, we would see light we would see holiness in everyone just as obviously as our physical eyes look on their body. We would see their, their worth just as obviously as our physical eyes see just the form, which we can even consider to be worthless. And so the topic of vision ends up being a fascinating topic because the Course is talking about something in us that can, we might say sense, we might say no, we might say feel, but can directly experience or directly see, you know, in, in a different sort of way, the incredible attributes the Course says that we all possess in our true nature. And that's a topic that Emily and I have both been fascinated by for some time, because even though the Course says everyone's had glimpses of the other world, um, I think most of us have had pretty like partial diluted glimpses, <clears throat> but those glimpses can be much more full blown. Um, and that's a topic that I think is really fascinating because having a more full blown experience of vision is a powerful, unforgettable, overwhelming experience. So both Emily and I have, have talked about this and, and uh, it, it's, really, it's really a fascinating topic. I'm sure there are things that you'd like to say at this point, Emily. Yeah, it is a fascinating topic. And we've already discussed that the theme of this event is love at first sight. And it's a beautiful idea but typically what we actually see with our physical eyes at first sight is not love. We tend to have judgment at first sight, regardless of whether we are looking at a stranger or whether we are with someone that is in our immediate family. And so what we tend to do is we don't see the holiness in others as we've described and as Dr. Bob described so beautifully, what we tend to see first is the errors and the flaws within each other. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's so much to talk about in relation to this, and obviously we'll go more in depth in our, our full-blown talk. But one of the things that has fascinated me is that what the Course is talking about as vision is an actual category of spiritual experience. It's not well known in the culture. There are other kinds of experiences that I think are more talked about. Um, you know, all kinds of unusual experiences that people have like near death experiences and uh, memories of past lives, uh, ESP. But if you, if you query a crowd, you'll find that a good percentage of people 
have had unusual experiences that sound very much like what the Course talks about as an experience of vision, um, where they suddenly see people in a different way. People suddenly take on a radiance. Um, one of the main things people talk about is people take on an incredible beauty. And it's a beauty that's not, it's like an unearthly beauty, you could say. It's a beauty of the soul, a beauty of the spirit that everyone has. Um, so experiences of vision are experiences where suddenly it's like a different eye has been opened in us and we see people in a powerfully new way um, that is very much like what the Course describes. It's exactly like what the Course and describes. Robert, as we've discussed prior, this is something that seems very lofty, but it's actually a rather common experience. And you don't have to be a spiritual student to experience some form of vision. Helen and Bill had their own version of vision in their initial A Better Way moment when they joined to find a better way to go through life to collaborate versus compete. And that's the moment that the course was, was, was born originally. Right. And they didn't call that, they didn't think vision. of it as a spiritual experience or think of it as vision. Um, but they clearly saw something in each other that was trustable, that was clean, that was worth joining with that deserved a certain kind of faith because to embark on that goal they embarked on, you, you can't do that without some measure of faith. They saw something in each other. And the course explicitly says that they must have seen each other through a vision that was not of the body. So that mm -hmm. was a kind of a milder experience of vision. And yet we we have as we're saying, this experience is more common than one might suggest, and there's a range to it. So you can have a full-blown uh, vision experience where you can see the other person as light, or you can see the goodness and beauty in them and have more of, I guess, what we would refer to as a lower level version of vision. Helen had her own experience of full-blown vision in a, in a subway incident. Would you like to describe that? Yeah, I'm sure many of us know this, this story. Um, long before the course started coming through, this would have been like in the 1930s, so quite a long time before the course came. Helen was riding a subway, and she didn't like riding in the subway. She took taxis everywhere, and she was just revolted by the, the sad display of humanity around her as she saw it. So Helen, in the 1930s, she had an experience on a subway, in New York City, where because she was so revolted by the people she saw around her, she closed her eyes to shut out the scene. And she had an experience of herself basically seeing herself go into the light of God. That wasn't the experience of vision. The, the light was, it was emanating such powerful love that she found it overwhelming and she opened her eyes to kind of exit that scene, the, the, the inner experience she was having. And then she saw the same picture of the subway train, obviously with the same people. And now she felt this incredible, like intense love for all of them. The people who were, that she, the people she found disgusting uh, a moment earlier, now she she found them incredibly um, lovely, and she loved them with the same love that she had been feeling from the light from God, and that was absolutely an experience of vision. And it's a reminder that we can have again, we can have these experiences here. Um, Bob read that beautiful line from Lesson 158, Christ's vision has one law. It does not look upon a body and mistake it for the son of, for the son whom God created. But then in the next paragraph, it says, this can be taught and must be taught by all who would achieve it. And so vision isn't something that is unachievable here or is available just for a lucky few. 
it's something, it's a, it's a faculty that we can cultivate within us. We can see with vision, which really means seeing only love, seeing holiness in others, seeing beyond the form of their body and beyond the form of their behaviors or personality or whatnot. Through that, to their inherent goodness, worth, equality, holiness, all of the things about them that are eternally true because God created those things. That's what you see when you see with vision. And we have the capability of doing that here. That's what the course is leading us to. That's why it calls it, we calls vision one of its goals. Yeah. And you could say that <clears throat> that vision is the goal because the course is leading us to true perception. Its goal is to go from false perception to true perception. And once we achieve total true perception, God lifts us back into the state of knowledge, which is heaven. Uh, well, true perception is vision. And so mm -hmm. you could say the whole course is there to lead us to a state where we see everyone truly and seeing them truly means seeing them with Christ's vision, seeing them with the eyes of Christ. Um, I did want to read one passage that's one of my favorite vision passages, and it's one that Dr. Bob did not read. Um, this is from chapter 17 in the text, section two, and it's the first paragraph of that section. And it really gives you a sense of why we want vision. He says, can you imagine how beautiful those you forgive will look to you. In no fantasy have you ever seen anything so lovely. Nothing you see here, sleeping or waking, <clears throat> comes near such loveliness, and nothing will you value like unto this, nor hold so dear. Nothing that you remember <clears throat> that made your heart seem to sing with joy has ever brought you even a little part of the happiness this sight will bring you, for you will see the Son of God. You will behold the beauty that the Holy Spirit loves to look upon and that he thanks the Father for. He was created to see this for you until you learn to see it for yourself, and all his teaching leads to seeing it and giving thanks with him. Those lines are so memorable because they say nothing we experience here can come close to the happiness of looking on another person with vision. Nothing comes close. So we should want and we should cultivate the desire to open these eyes in us because seeing just one person through vision would be a happier experience than anything this world has ever given us. Robert, if, if, I'd like to read something too, if, if you don't mind, just to reinforce and underscore this idea of how common vision is and how achievable it is for all of us if we choose to see with love. And this is, famously the Louisville experience from Thomas Merton, who was a contemplative monk here in the States. He I don't was know how well known Merton is in Germany, but he's very well known in the Catholic world. Yes. And he's, he's, he was around long before the course, long before we had this term vision, and yet he had a full blown vision experience out of the blue one day, on, oh, he was running an errand on the streets of Louisville, Kentucky. And so I, I wanna read this because it's an example of what happens in a vision experience. So if you are listening and you're thinking, okay, that sounds good, but I'm not sure like what happens in mm -hmm. vision, I, I take a listen to, to this experience from Thomas Merton. He writes, in Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, 
I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all these people, that they were mine and I theirs, and we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world of liberation from an illusory difference was such a relief and such a joy to me that I almost laughed out loud. I have the immense joy of being a man, a member of a race in which God himself became incarnate. As if the sorrows and stupidities of the human condition could overwhelm me now that I realize what we all are. And if only everybody could realize this but it cannot be explained. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around shining like the sun. Then it was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, the depth of their hearts where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach, the core of their reality, the person that each one is in God's eyes if only they could all see themselves as they really are, if only we could see each other that way all the time, there would be no more war, no more hatred, no more cruelty, and no more greed. This cannot be seen, only believed and understood by a peculiar gift. And the peculiar gift that we're talking about here is vision. And I think that this is just such an extraordinary statement from Merton because he so perfectly describes vision well before the course came along, seeing the truer truth that's underneath each of us and having that burst of love. That, that's what we're describing here with the vision. That's such a perfect experience to illustrate it. And, and there's a plaque to this day, right, at that corner. There is. It, it, it remains, as we've discussed before, we think the only plaque on earth dedicated to vision, although it's not called that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm so glad you read that. That's such a beautiful experience. I love that line. How can you tell them that they're all walking around shining like shining the sun? Shining like the sun. Yeah, it's a great line. Yeah. So you can see why the course would be leading us to this goal. Uh, And I think before we stop, we should talk a little bit about how we open those eyes in us. Um, I think the course would say forgiveness is the way we do it, but I'd like to talk about it in a little bit of a different way. And that is that, that if we want to see that in other people, if we want to invite that, what he called peculiar gift, If we want to invite that peculiar gift, the main thing we have to do, I believe, is be willing to look past what our eyes see in people, right? We are so focused on their body, their physical appearance. We're so focused on their behavior, all the things they do, all the things they say, We're so focused on all the kind of accoutrements, like the things they own, um, the house they live in, their, their place in society. We are absolutely riveted on what our eyes see in them. And while we focus there and while we grant that reality and while we think that's it, then we are not inviting that peculiar gift. We're actually pushing it away without knowing it. So it's the, what Bob was saying when he quoted the course is saying the sight of this world is costing you the sight of the real world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we don't know that by pouring energy into, you know, the visible appearance of each other, we're pushing that away, but we are. And so the course is training us to develop a habit of overlooking what you might call the phenomenal person, the outward appearance, 
overlooking it, overlooking it, overlooking it. And each time we do that, we are inviting either, you know, the Helen and Bill lower level experience where they suddenly saw each other, you know, as clean and pure and trustworthy, um, or we're, in, we're inviting the Thomas Merton top of the mountain experience that is an incredibly joyous transport that's so unforgettable that it's worth putting a plaque on the spot where we had it. Yeah, and when I think about how to get to vision, and I love the idea that what vision sees is the real world, and what the real world is, is only loving thoughts. So only the love is real, and that's what, the, what vision sees. And we have the capability within us to do that here. And I think when we think of vision, we tend to think I would never get there because my mind is so full of these judgments. And the judgment is what I immediately go to. How am I supposed to get to this higher perspective? And yet the Course says throughout that this is how Jesus saw. Jesus was a man who saw the face of Christ and his brothers and thus remembered God. This is how the Holy Spirit sees. They don't see any error in any of us, any guilt, any sin. They only see the love. That's what we're being trained to do. That's what we can do. And the more we exercise this muscle within us, we can go from a lower level, just seeing some, some goodness in the other person all the way up to a Merton type experience. We can do that here. We have the capability of doing that here. And that's an amazing thought. Yeah, I think that it's easy to be a bit despairing, like, oh, that's just more than I could ever experience or I could ever, you know, uh, open my mind to, but the mind, I think we all know the mind can be trained. Mm -hmm. We can be trained to go places in our mind that we would think we could never go. And that's the point of the course is to train our minds to actually overlook, overlook, overlook until we open those eyes within us. And we do see everyone walking around shining like the sun. Right. And it, it's, uh, as I mentioned in lesson 158, it can be taught right in the introduction to the course. It says that when we remove the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, but when we remove those blocks of judgment and attack, what is left, but allowing love's presence to come through and seeing with vision, because we are choosing to see that over the errors. And that's what, that's the way we train ourselves to, to get there. Yeah. We are at the top of the We're at the top. Yeah. Hour. So there's more that we could say. And obviously in our actual talk, we'll be talking about some of the practical methods the course offers, as well as sharing some more. Those Merton experiences, I think, are very important to share. Otherwise, it all sounds a bit nebulous and like you can't, you know, get your, your hands around it. Um, but I guess for now, our time is up. Well, it is a preview. So a preview. If, if you want to yeah. hear more, then you, have, you can come to our session. It's a warm up, and you definitely warmed us up more than we expected. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your, uh, your insights and your reflections. And we're definitely looking forward to hearing more uh, during your talk on, I think it's next week, Sunday, right? Sunday, yeah. Sunday, Berlin time afternoon. And uh, thanks so much. You're, you're wrapping up this warm up series. And um, it's a pleasure and an honor seeing you here and knowing that you can come in and join from anywhere in this world and yeah. um, others as well. So well, thank you so much for, for having us. And we're look for, looking forward to uh, seeing you once more in a week and a half. Or is total it pleasure, total pleasure. A week. Yeah. So uh, th begins Thursday next week, so a little bit less than a week. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you to all the translators. This was a big job tonight. <laughs> thank yeah. you. So much. Sorry to the translators. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to you, Andreas, for yeah. pulling this together. Yeah. What what an incredible thing that you've done here, and and it's it is a privilege and an honor to be part of it. And thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. Yeah.